What's up everybody, it's Soren Baker here on Unique Access and today we have the honor and privilege to have Mr. Sir Jinx coming hey, back in man. the building. Thank you, man. Cheers. Yes. My guy. Always a pleasure with Jinx, man. And Glad you had me back, man. Always. We're going to have you back for part three. I heard it was a few requests yes. in, the, uh, so the, the in great, the comments. The great thing is people loved the first round of interviews we did. Oh, I saw that. And it's, it's just great that you're coming back because... I've known Jinx since the 90s, and right. obviously was listening and studying him way before that. So there's so right. much to talk about every time with Jinx, and we'll never run out of topics. But today, because of all the comments, we're going to talk a lot about his work with Cool G Rap, because a lot of people cool want to man. see that. But one thing we didn't talk about last time that I really wanted to was Short Dogs in the House. Oh, yeah. Because Too Short, I think, is one of the best rappers of all time. He's one of my favorite rappers of all time. Yeah. And you did phenomenal work on that album with Q, nothing right. but a word. Yeah. So this was also an interesting time because the album came out in 90, but it was around uh, coming off of the NWA Ruthless movement and all that. And right. Short was running parallel with that right. at the same time. And Quiet as Kept was as big sell sales wise right as them <laughs> i think he was on jive before he was but it was on, on dangerous records i think yeah dangerous music dangerous music and but um the crazy thing about too short bro is too short was the first rapper that i heard go down south go to new york go you know to the midwest and everybody knew his lyrics mm -hmm. like so when we was traveling like with um like, you know, Big Daddy Kane and Kid and Play and, you know, Salt and Pepper and stuff, you know, some some of their, their rhymes is made a certain kind of way, but Too Short Rhymes was like mad open so people could understand what he was saying. And I saw a bunch of like New York people just astounded, like they never heard of him and the whole crowd, boom, boom. Oh, clap, boom, boom. Keep it oh. super funky. It was, oh man, it was, a, it was a good sight that I saw that that happened to, uh, um, that happened to Too Short. And also NWA was on the show. So when we was back, when we on tour, when we went, we started in the East Coast and then the East Coast rappers that was on the tour, they end up, you know, being the closers. Right. So as we start coming west, they start moving them further back in the show. Like, okay. you know what I'm saying? Start moving too short in NWA. Cause it's like, they was like, we went to one show and uh, after too short in NWA, I think like Ghetto Boys or something, they, everybody just like, like left the building. Like, wow. Like they was performing <laughs> in front of the seats. That's but, who they were there to see. I mean, cause yeah, but so they had to figure it out. I remember New York dudes were so mad that they had to lose they they headline and spot. <laughs> oh man, that was beautiful. And too short and NWA did that. They were the first rappers that moved to the back of an East Coast tour. Because if not, the people's gonna leave. But right. that was just at that time, you know. So right, they, right. they did have a good thing. But the easy E and the too short, oh man, that was that was a show you had to see. That was the essence of uh, hip hop, you know, for the West Coast when we started uh, doing real shit. Like, so Jinx, after doing these tours or in the midst of these tours with Short and seeing what Short was doing to the crowds and then Easy's mm -hmm. impact on the crowd, and seeing that their flows were so different from some of the other artists that were mm -hmm. prominent at the time, how would you say that affected how you approached or thought of producing? Well, I would. I that we was all banging the same concept, you know? So to see one of us make it, it's still the conversation of the West Coast. The West Coast still had to prove our opinion on, on, on music and, and hip hop. And I know that like the East Coast, it, it came from the East Coast, but when we gave our version, it seemed like we were being a little more, there was being a little more critical on how we were approaching the music. And to see that the fans were the judge was 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 that 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 was that was a that was a good feeling because right. you don't know. I mean, when you when you put something together and you say, well, this is where we from, and we're gonna go out there and we're gonna push our line. You don't know it could be not accepted very well. Right. You know, I didn't see people go out of town. You know, go out balling, come back crawling. <laughs> you know, they thought it was easy to to. Uh, 
you know, go to Memphis or go to Atlanta and think you just finna take over the club back in them days. That was a zero. <laughs> they had their own shit going on. But if they like you, then, you know, then there's people that go to college or there's people that move around throughout the United States that, you know, took that West Coast with them. And then it reminded them, like Florida and stuff like that. It, it looked the same. So um, I just felt, I felt like my, my voice was going to be heard through the music. Like I, I used to listen to music and make the music sound like that's somebody's eyes. Like I'm, I'm looking through every dude eyes that when I make, when I was making beats at, at that time. And when you walk into a room that it's a, you know, your body has a, a instrumental that plays every time mm -hmm. you think you look good. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you think you look nice. It's like you hear, you singing it to yourself, you know? And when I made beats, I always wanted, them beats to be that world, like those dudes' eyes. I wanted to be like gangster dudes and the motorcycle guys and the graffiti guys and the break dancing guys. I was being the eyes for all them through the beat. And then I dealt with the rapper to make me want to do beats. I wanted to, to speak for a certain class of hip hop guys from the West Coast because I thought, you know, we were good. I, I, I thought we. You know, we learn from the East Coast, but, uh, you know, it's all like fighting. There's a different kind of techniques. This right. is a, one technique. You know, you, you guys got that technique. Down South got their own technique, you know. And then when you sit on your grind and you do it, you know, you'd be happy for the fruits of the labor. And you'd be like, yeah, we, we, we came in this game to sell records. That's what we came to do. You know, now to make friends and kiss babies, that's whatever. That's cool. <laughs> But everybody, whoever made money off of rap, that was something that wasn't invented, you know, 40 years ago. That right. was not a job to seek after to be a rapper, you know. So when the people like it, then the people are the judge. And I and I at first New York had a real grip on what could be dope and what was perceived dope. But um, West Coast just start having a little more fun with it, you know, adding a little more baseline, adding a little more piano and strings and I remember a couple of my New York guys it was like has he's like your music is, is mad musical <laughs> like that's because at first it was boom bap like boom bap. you know it was hard and we added like the groove to it so I, I believe West Coast you know um, East Coast made up hip-hop made up the format West Coast made up how to sell it mm. down south got the best hooks of all time I would agree yeah. They definitely do. They got the and best have hooks of all time. For a long time. And they added to, you know, this 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 thing called hip hop. They they did put their mark in there, you know. You got Houston, but that's still down south, but they still was not East Coast rappers. You, right. you didn't have to be an East Coast rapper to get on. That's what they put in our head. Like if in LA, back in the day, you know a dude from New York and he was in your group, oh yeah, I was gonna get a record deal. Right. Like it was, it was really gonna happen for you. But that's how everybody thought of it. But then when they, East Coast, down South, Miami, everybody started knowing that we got the same kind of ghettos, you know, then we started connecting. Be like, well, I like his voice. I like his attempt at his, what he doing as a rapper. I like his aspect of understanding. Like, mm -hmm. you can have a Just Ice that was going on, and then you have a Too Short. You know, they, they from two separate things, but to me, they say they speak in the same thing, but it's just like another language. You know? Right, right. And we was liking the language of the West Coast. Well, of course, the whole world. The whole world. The does. whole world <laughs> like the way the West Coast sounds. So I just was happy to be a part of, uh, just being a part of the beginning of something. You know what I'm saying? Like that was always a blessing to me. And seeing all the guys that come out of it, and the rap guys, the producer guys, and you know, we all connected. You know, back in the day, West Coast was a little divided. But now that we all older, everybody can call. I call DJ Quick. I call, you know, Battle Cat. You know, call Daz just to see what he's doing. You know, and that, that's the dope thing about how long we've been in this rap game and banging this West Coast, and with Dre, of course. Of course. And then uh, before we get to Kooji rap, one other thing with right. uh, none but a word to me. That was to me like one of those early records of the combination of Titans to be mm -hmm. Titans in the making. So what did you notice about how Short worked versus how Cube worked and what made that song so special? Well, the, 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 the cold thing is like, um, um, Too Short reminded me of Eric, like reminded okay. me of Eazy-E, like they were both kind of the same kind of thing. So, but 
when Too Short came around and I started seeing him, he had bread. So he was like with him and Pizzo and, and, and Too Clean, right? Mm -hmm. But he had bread though. So that, that, that's what stood out because he was, he, I don't know. It looked like he had more bread than Cube, like, because the back in them days, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? We ain't talking now. We said, well, I don't know either. I ain't going to call nobody <laughs> pockets. But I'm just saying he had a lot of money then. He already was doing independent it. doing, selling records on, on you, know, street, you know, street tapes or whatever. Mm -hmm. So he always had money. So um, even when we went on tour, he had his own tour buses and, you know, he was doing it big. Like, we had to keep up with him on how he was doing it. And he set the pace when all the East Coast dudes used to be like on in vans and and uh you know they had can you know convoy across the three uh, across the United States and they'd stay like in a red roof inn or something or, or you know like a lodge type shit. Right. Easy and too short. You can check the records. Easy and too short changed how rappers travel. Hmm. I was there. Okay. So anything before '90, if you was like. You know, a big a big artist like you know Heavy D or you know they 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 stayed in a certain kind of thing. But the the mega rappers just they didn't have no tour buses. Right, they had right. vans and they were staying over there <laughs> right off the freeway. But easy right off the exit, <laughs> right off the exit, right there. Everybody can check easy out. Easy in, easy cut. out. Yeah, easy in, easy out. But Eric <laughs> and Too Short, they set the pace because uh, Eric was paying for it. And it, I mean, we was on tour. You know, we get good with somebody on tour. And they were like, where you at? Oh, we at Sheraton. Where y'all at? Word? Oh, wow, that's crazy. Nah, <laughs> come up there, man. Come hang out. You know, and then we had to, and that was the beginning of tearing up the hotels. Like, mm. you know, when people start of our kind start flooding them them situations that they never thought they were gonna see all these niggas in this motherfucking <laughs> hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and Eric would do that, because you know, back in the day, if you remember, um, um and they said, you know, I had everybody thinking I was only, you know, I was born in 73. Right. Now everybody want to know the AGE. AGE. So at that time, he would have been 15 years old. Right. So now it's kids in the hotel looking for Easy e thinking like he a Justin Bieber, like he's a kid. <laughs> so that was one side. And then the NWA, the bitches a bitch and, you know, Ren and, you know, all the stuff that they were doing that brought the older people and okay. the gangsters and the I ain't going to take this in my city. People came, right. you know, no, this is my hood. <laughs> right, right. And then we got kids. I swear to God, I will, I will, uh, if somebody can plug up some little sensors to me and you can re-see that, man, it looks like it looks crazy. Little kids like we're easy e and <laughs> girls, you know, twenty and older, like yo, where Ice Cube at? You know, with these, <laughs> the age difference was crazy. <laughs> but That's Eric wild. definitely uh, uh, had us out there on tour buses and stuff like that. And I saw the change of hip hop and how we influence East Coast, just like East Coast in influence us. Well, that ties nicely into Living Let Dive with right. Cool G Rap and DJ Polo album. So you you go to New York. And that's with America's Most Wanted. So right. is that how you got to meet Cool G Rap? Uh-uh. Break it down. How did you get to meet him? And how how I met Cool G Rap was when I um I'll put this right here. I um I was I was um, working with Mike Conception right at the time, and uh, I was living with him. You know, he lived out there in Carson. You know, I was a kid, like 18, 19 years old, and uh, uh, Mike Conception took me in, let me let me live with him. And uh, he would help me um, buy uh, a little equipment, and uh, you know he was, because he knew a lot of people too. You know he knew the Michael Jacksons and right. the Teddy Riley's. He knew all them, so he was going to introduce me to them people. So he introduced me to this one lady named Karen Jones. Karen Jones is like the VP of Warner Brothers, you know. Mm -hmm. So he would take me up there, you know, kind of flash me around like I'm the new kid in town. To check you, y'all need to check for this guy. So then I ended up meeting Benny Medina, and then Benny, me and Benny Medina got cool. He started letting me reference music, like he'll play music for me. So um, I think I left, and then um, they they had no clue. And um, so the America's Most Wanted comes out. So now they looking at me like, oh shit, like, that's, that's the guy, that, that dude that, that was here all the time talking. <laughs> uh, Right then, then, then they say, then Karen say, "Have you heard a guy named uh, Coogee Rap?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I know I heard of Coogee Rap." 
So they said I was doing remixes for Warner Brothers. Like right. so I was working with a dude named Trey Lou, that's George Clinton's son. Mm -hmm. And I did a couple of other uh little musical adjustments for them. And I was getting bread. That was like the first time I ever got like six thousand dollars to do something. Like I, I was amazed. Back like, then, that's cake. Oh man, it was to see a check and be like here, and then they they kept working with me. So it wasn't like you know it went on to to do other things like when A and M and and, and and what's Quincy Jones label and, and stuff. Right, it, it it went on to do do more things. So she said, why don't you remix? Um, help G Rap remix about four songs. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh yeah. He's like, well you know we ain't got no budget. You know the what what what. So they floated me some cash. It was some cool cash. I didn't know it was going to be that long. I, I didn't know we was. I didn't know it was going to turn into what what it turned into. You okay. know what I'm saying? Because it was almost like the America's Most Wanted when they when the Bomb Squad was supposed to do a couple of songs at first, and then you know when they figured it. That, well, they they wanted to take on the whole record. So when I got the records, they sent them to me on ADAT, and I had to go get them. Um, because he had a different kind of ADAT, so I had to get him transferred over to the ADATs I had. And the first song was On The Run. Mm. So it was On The Run, The Great Train Robbery, uh, I think. Um, it was it was a few of them that he already had when, mm -hmm. when they sent me all these boxes of, of <laughs> shit. And um, so I went into the studio and immediately started assembling all the songs and putting them back together. So I shot it back to him. And then they flew him out here. So they oh, flew wow. him and um, 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 Polo. Okay. They was convinced when I when I when I dissected them tapes that he had. Man, I had a you know I had a pit crew in the studio that was crazy. You know, my, we will figure it out. You right, know, your right, heart right. stopped beating. We can make you come back alive. <laughs> I bet you somebody got the answer in that goddamn room. So uh, we put the assembled the stuff back, and I said, well, he just need to put a better vocal on it, you okay. know, because it came from, he was working on it at, at, at his house. I added music to it. And then, um, so he came down, when he came down, I think we did um, The Great Train Robbery. I don't know if I said that one. Yep. Um, um, uh, I, I'll start thinking of all, all the ones that well, he had okay. when he came down. But when he came down, and um, I was just telling this cold story, we was, um, they had him living good. You know, Warner Brothers got a deep pocket jack. And uh, <laughs> and uh, for me, giving them such a good price, it kind of like made us be able to have fun with the budget. Okay. Like, so it was like I was in charge of the budget too. Like, oh, wow. You know, because I had to make the studio time. So, uh -huh. and then I had to deal with my hotel arrangement because they had us in the hotel right there on um, La Cienega. And holiday, like on sunset, like next sunset, all right, we, we had a good time. We had a good time. So with Train Robbery, since that's one of the early ones that you worked on on, mm -hmm. on the album, that one always stood out to me because it made me realize one of your many strengths was and is, is being able to make these mini movies, right. very cinematic. And his raps and the story that he tells on there is very vivid and very graphic, like something right. Cube would have done. Right. But obviously in his own way. But what did you notice about Cool G Rap's uh, vivid storytelling that was maybe different or similar to Cube's? Well, Cube, Cube writes a certain kind of way. Cube, Cube pays more attention to the effect of the rhyme, like when Cube write a story, he, he, he wants it to, to affect you, you know, and Coogee Rap wants to impress you. So they, so Coogee Rap, when he, when he, when he, the similarities is they both love stories, but Coogee Rap is going to go at it in a format that, that's, you know, not the, not something you would think. He will, he would say words. So he he's in, he want to impress you, like, mm -hmm. like, you know what I'm saying? Like when he left the girl with the mouth flooded. Right, right, right. So he forever so forth with saying da 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 da. And Cube want to be like, you know, we gonna revolt. We gonna do this tonight. That's what we gonna do. Right. And it affects you, like, man, that Cube music had me turned up. 
you know, with the Coogee rap, you're like, oh man, you heard what he said, like in that amount of time, like, you mm. know. So he, the, the similarities are there, you know, as well as, as with uh, um, Exhibit. Absolutely. And, and dealing with that caliber of uh, MC. So Cube was was labeled, you know, a MC, like when he did the, what was it, the, um, the um, uh, I think Cube went to the top of, of that idea with the grand finale. I think, and that was the last song he did with well, with the ruthless, ruthless situation. Right. But the, the way he just rapped, that was he put himself in the in, in you know in the category of being a lyricist right there. Absolutely right. And I think that was one of the things that amazed me about Cube, especially when you look at Ruthless, and then as a solo artist um, up through just since only things we've talked about is up through right. um, Death Certificate, is that the overwhelming majority of his songs, other than really his verse on Grand Finale, overwhelming majority, it's very topic, it's very specific, right. and almost all of it is a story of mm -hmm. some thing, whereas Grand Finale, he was flexing right. in a different type of way, and even None But A Word has some of that too, but grand finale is just totally different because right. we didn't hear cube rapping like that really right but cube was also rapping with doc so when you it was pen versus pen right right so you know when when you're doing a good thing you know me and you making music i'm not gonna go off to the, you know the deep end you know I'm, I'm gonna do something that you're gonna do on your record i'm gonna play how you play so cube will play how they play so right. when he get on your record he'll play how you play right but try to Finesse your situation. Yeah. And be like, oh, okay, you did it, you know, da 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 uh, that the track masters did, but right. but one of the ones that I love that doesn't uh -oh. get a lot of talk is number one with a bullet with Kane. Right. So Jinx, Big Daddy Kane. To mm -hmm. my knowledge, they never had any beef, but they always had a competitive rivalry because they're both so brilliant as writers. Right. So how how and what did you see that they pulled out of each other that was a little different than maybe what we saw in a symphony, for instance? Well, when I when I when I knew when I met G Rap, I had I was already familiar with Big Daddy Kane. Okay. But like as a fan, like you know what I'm saying. So then I was one of those people that you know you see I see you again, and I see him in peculiar places. Like you'd be like, oh okay. So okay. when we uh, did the record, it was it was it was some weird stuff going on at the time with them and I think Boogie Down, okay. Boogie Down Productions, they was uh, having some type of uh, uh, situation with MC Shan and all that stuff was going right. on. And that still was real, real like that. So with G-Rap, he was like getting away from that. Because right. Big Daddy Kane and KRS, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, they, they went to school together. All right. So the beef between Cold Chillin' or, you know what I'm saying, and um, and then that that was going on at the time when we was uh, working on the record, so G Rap just brought Big Daddy Kane, so he could have had you know guest appearances by everybody. Of course. But everybody was on that beef, mm. and so he they wanted to separate themselves from that beef between MC Shan and KRS. Gotcha. So coming to work with me, I start feeling like, you know, okay, they don't want to be a part of that. So that's why none of it is mentioned on his record, like mm. the direction or, or even using the Bronx or anything in a derogatory, you know, way. He, he we, we just forgot about. It. We, he didn't want to be a part of it. So when Big Daddy Kane came, it was just like you know his sparring partner that he felt at home, like you know, like right, right. He he, he was far away from home, Coogee Rap, uh, and to be inspired. You know, then here comes Big Daddy Kane, you know, that's the OG and his hood, you know, right. with the record company and all the stuff that, that they did together. So for him to get on the song and like the beat, like, you know what I'm saying? Like he, It was he, great. 
he had to like the beat. So at some point, da 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 da, and that was that. Uh, I think that that Temptations. Well, I was gonna say that was later used famously in Crazy in Love. Right, right. But right. Jinx had it a little bit earlier. Right, I, I was in the crates uh, a little bit earlier, and and it was funny when I heard it the first time. I really and truly thought somebody was playing Coogee Rap record. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I was out of town or something, and I hear somebody, blah, 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 blah. but I can't hear it really. But I'm like, somebody playing Coogee Rap? I'm like, nah, Beyonce used it. I was like, ah, that's cool. That's dope. Well, that that's one of the many great things, and I think about this. Well, she jacked me for my beat. Well, that's what like, I'm saying. Like, no, and I said, Jack, I made Jack for beats. Yeah, I, I got Beyonce it. Beyonce Jack me for my beats. I got it. I got <laughs> and it. And made it famous. <laughs> well. Well, made them horns famous. Made the horns famous. Right, right, right. I always enjoy seeing how producers will use the same sample differently. Right. Or the same song, a different part. Or right. they'll flip it and maybe use it for eight bar loop and somebody else looped it for four. You know, it's just all those that was that was tricks. the cut back in the day, like being a producer and dealing with samples and editing and stuff like that, is that sometimes you want to use the image of the song. Mm -hmm. You want to you want to you want to use you want to remember that, like you know, right. good time. Doom, doom. You want to remember that, but then there's other producers that want to use those same things and, and mix them up, mm. you know. But but now you be like, oh, that is that song, you right. know. So some producers like to use the likeness of the song, and then there's producers like myself that be like, oh, that's where you got that from? Like, right. wow, that's crazy. So back in them days when we, producers was making music, we was all making music in a direction to have an identity, not to like be a part of nobody else's ride. Like, right, right. We, 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 you know, somebody had an ASR-10, somebody had a, you know, SP-1200, you know, but everybody had their own mechanics to make the music. And then you was ready to display your beat at any given time. Like any time that you, you play a beat, it was supposed to represent something. You right. know, it's like this, I'm, I'm still pushing this line. And that's what me being a producer and the producers that I I know, we do have a voice through the music. There, There is some consistency right. with um, the direction and the 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 harmonics of the songs, you know. Well, speaking of your voice, one of the other records you did on Live and Let Die was the Operation CB. My and, song, yeah. And that one was the first time I remember hearing you on the song as much as I did, other than the way earlier right, stuff, right, of right, course, right, 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 but right. of that era. Uh -huh. Where I was like, man, Jinx is like really on the song, like right. he's talking. But then right. I wanted you to explain how you came up with your role or the kind of the element of you being the one actually doing the cock blocking. The, the cock blocking thing came from, um, once again, like I said, Warner, Bro Warner Brothers treated us super well. <laughs> we was we was nice. I had a brand new Mercedes at the time. We was nice. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it fit. It fit over there in Beverly Hills, you know, because I, I still stayed in Westminster at the time. So I was okay. probably still living with moms, but pushing this brand new Benz. And then... Um, oh. Of course, you know, me and G-Rap go out, you know, have dinner and do stuff, go to the clubs, you know, bring some girls back. So um, I had my own room, right? So uh, G-Rap had his own room. So the girl uh, that I was hanging out with, you know, she had a little homegirl, brought the homegirl. So G-Rap liked the girl, went into, you know, so he went on with the girl. But me and the girl I was with, she had to go. Okay. So she, she, the homegirl was like, I'm going to stay, though. That's the girl say with G-Rap, I'm going to stay. <laughs> so I'm like, what the fuck just happened? So I was like, all right, then, later. And so the girl, you know, goes off and does whatever she wants. So then here we go. Doom, 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 doom. G, what y'all doing? <laughs> 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 he opened the door. What's up, Jinx? I'm nice. What's up? What's going on? <laughs> so <laughs> out of that, we, we end up making a real song about him with between the door. Like, yo, yo, G, where's the ice? Like, you know, I, I was just, and then I started fucking with him because I know he was getting mad because my girl left. So that's where Operation CB came from. And then now I was like, me and, me and G Rap, we used to laugh and joke. So now I'm doing like a Mission Impossible to okay. ruin his night. Like, so, you know, like, I was like, you know, coming down the window, hey, G, man, your <laughs> shoes is still in the da 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 da. Like, and we, we used to laugh about how many times somebody can, uh, 
you know, block your vagina access. And uh, and so it was just dope. I, I, I we, and that's what I, I liked with working with G Rap is you can like throw him an idea, and 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 that, and that rap right there had nothing to do with crime. It had right. nothing to do with, um, you know, doing something wrong. It was actually just the the typical college. Yo, G man, where's the ice? <laughs> right, right. And it, but even though. Thematically, it's very different than the majority of the mm -hmm. album. I think it was a nice, and the sequencing worked right. well with it to where it was kind of in the middle of the album. It wasn't like a throwaway song, but it also, I think, still fit in very well. When, 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 when I made that song, it was actually a homage song to King T. Because mm. King T raps on beats. Right. So that was like a... A thing with me dealing with uh, DJ Pooh and um, and and bringing that sound to um, G Rap by because G Rap also had a talk like sex that was similar to yeah it had a similar um, sonic boom right. like that kind of thing and so that song was you know talk like sex Operation CB like you know what I'm saying they they have a, a, a marriage. It's a continuation of sorts. Of, of a song, like I, I tried to make a, a cousin of that song, right. and then it was also knowing like, oh, okay. And then Q made uh, Nappy Dugout. So Nappy Dugout, that song, King T made Nappy Dugout. So all these songs are married, you know, like, and they're the same. So that's why I had like Operation CB, because uh, that definitely was an Ice Cube beat at first. but. Okay. Um, um, you know, I was just making beats, but I can tell like from that Operation TV, I and it bang, it really banged the day. Like it it's really, a good one. It's it, a good it went one. across well for the internet. It sounds good in the car, of, like from the internet. Well, speaking of Cuba and G Raf, we got the two to the head, which right. to my off the top of my head, my recollection when uh, I thought about it, that is that that's the first East Coast West Coast Southern. Mega collaboration. Star collaboration of that Ever. magnitude. Ever. So No, no, not magnitude. Ever. Ever. Right. <laughs> well, that, that was a, that's a phenomenal song. It was dope. I, and like I say, man, I say it all the time, man. I have, if you have regrets in life, you know, I have, I have one regret in hip hop. The, yep. my, my one regret is that I didn't, we didn't put Willie D on that track. Well, that was going to be one of my questions. Why wasn't he on it? <laughs> uh, because it was assumed to be too long at the time. Okay. And it wasn't my call. It was Warner Brothers' call. Wow. So, you know, when we made up the thing, I, I was talking to Scarface, and they was in town. It's like one of those old rock movies. I mean, you know, like, yo, I call us, go, where you at? Yo, I'm in town right now. Hey, y'all come through. I got some bread for you. So, I mean, it was just supposed to be... Uh, G Rap and Scarface okay. at first. And then, um, so then Bushwick came, Willie D came, but then it was like, him. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I'm like, I, I wish Willie so D. So wait, he recorded? No, they, uh -huh. it, it was like they, they, the people that was there dealing with the, 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 the you know, the, the business of the song, you know, it, was, it wasn't just us in the studio. It was like, oh. you know, execs and other people in the studio. That, that when they came, when they actually came, because they had to be there to deal with them. And, oh, yeah, I want to be Scarface. Oh, yeah, I want to be Willie D. You know, I want to meet them all. But when if we was going to do the song, the song's going to be seven minutes. Right, right. Which was not, well, it was heard of back in the day. But it wasn't heard of, like, we had to meet that three, two, four, four-minute quota. You got right, right. to kind of wrap it up. So I wish uh, Willie D... My guy. I wish he could have been on that track, but um, Bushwick Bill, I remember uh, Scarface coming in, and then um, I played the song for Cube. I, I think we were doing something, and Cube just said, I need to get on that. Mm. And I'm like, for real? So get get the execs on the fire. <laughs> uh, I got Ice Cube want to get on the track. <laughs> and they, oh, man, when he came, that that was just like, you know, like, oh, like Jinx really did this. He pulled this together. Because I don't know if uh, Scarface and G-Rap had a relationship or anything. I knew Scarface. And G-Rap liked Scarface. Right. And G-Rap, uh, you know, of course, like Ice Cube. 
So uh, just to pull that whole song together, that was just like a phone call away. And everybody got paid too. So, you know, at least they got paid. That was a dope thing. The record yes. probably didn't do big, but y'all go check out, you know, it was two to the head, man. That's that's amazing. And it reminded me, mainly because it was the last song, but it right. reminded me of the Ruthless uh, grand finale last song type of vibe. And it had titans in the game. Well, that's funny together. that you bring up the... Um, the Ruthless uh, grand finale, because that beat is like, it inspired me from, was it something to bump in the car? You remember? Because it was like a uh, um, DOC uh, record oh. that Dr. Dre did. did like, um, is it, oh, it, and it's a, the Doc and the Doctor, I think is what you're talking right. about. Right, and it says something to bump in your car. That's the yeah. name of the, the song. But it's, um, it's all one, um, it, it has no brakes in it. Is it something right. to bump it in your car? Okay. So um, that was that was my original, knowing that I was going against that song by going with the George Clinton and dealing with that beat, and I just said I could pull that beat off with Ice Cube, mm. da da da, with you know you know uh, Scarface, with Coogee Rap, with Bushwick Bill. I can push. I can push that line. And, and 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 make a different song to where they people won't connect the two. Right. Okay. They won't be like, oh, you, it's the diggy diggy doc, yeah. y'all. Right. It's the diggy diggy doc. And I was like, I had always liked the beat, but I said the only way I can get it off is um, have all them on it, and nobody connected the two throughout the years. They never did, but they. It, I did know DOC made that beat, and I was like, I'm gonna do that again. Yeah. And then um, another one that I really liked on Live and Let Die was The Crime Pays. Uh, yeah. Because that's another one that has one of those great stories that, you know, weaves through the whole thing and is very powerful and memorable at the same time. So with the, as you guys are crafting all these different songs, what mm -hmm. was it about the crime element that was appealing to G-Rap so much at the time? Uh, he was just a good story writer. So when we when we like live and let die, I, I would think is is the first of the albums like of the Biggie Smalls and the you know the the live and let die. It's a kinda. precursor, yes. Right, right. Yeah. It's like the, when they was you know like 007. Like so, I was like in the 007. So the live and let die. That's mm -hmm. I got that. I, I made that up from me liking 007 and saying that Kooji rap is like a 007. Okay. Like, you know, he'll kill 20 people before the hook in the song, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he did. <laughs> he'll kill 100 people, like, you know, before the second hook, you know. So that's what the live and let die. So, you know, so when we, we came up with that, that was um, just, it, it was just crazy how we both came together. And the way he rhymed, it, it was just almost, almost like just closing your eyes. Like, he was your eyes for a minute and then you can use your imagination to follow along with it and how accurate he is about topics and, and you know key points that that you have to remember this in order to understand this flow mm -hmm. because it's going to come back on you you know so what he he was just dope and and he i i assume he wrote a lot of them not the ones that he i did the remix to but he he, he wrote a lot of them in la like he wanted to feel L.A. He wanted to write from the pen, like his pen didn't want to be from, you know what I'm saying, from Queens. Or he, 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 he wanted to write. He was happy with seeing Hollywood and we had rental cars and, and it was just different. And, you know, it girls was everywhere, you know. And um, that, that's where his pen started going. So he started being a little bit more humorous. Well, he was always humorous with his punchlines, no. but now is, you know, I, I think the beginning of the sun tree, you know, the palm trees and, and the Venice Beach and the Corvettes and the, you know, uh, uh, light sautéed breast uh, <laughs> uh, chicken. Ah, where do you think well, I was going? But like just good, good living. And then we was living real good at 20 years old. We was, we was really milking. Um. Everything you're saying really <laughs> reminds me of... Uh, the song from Above the Law, California, right. where it showed both sides of California. Right, 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 right. And kind of what you're saying about, you know, there's the one, the beautiful, bright, sunny side, but then there's the hood, crazy gangster side. Right, but this is now, 
G-Rap living through his rhyme, but now got an L.A. connect. Right. You know, it, it almost works out like that. It seems like it, uh, in a rap movie, like, you know, he, he come out here and then, you know, we're talking some big money now. You know, what do you want to do with, you know, da, da, da. Yeah, I got a good guy. His name is Jinx. You know, <laughs> hook up with him. Let's see what's going to go on. And But he, he, he did flourish out here. I mean, um, the music is dope. I mean, you know, and we made it out of the energy, you know, where, where, uh, you know, with, with Warner Brothers, they, they they had us living all right. Yeah, that's a monumental house. <laughs> they had us living good, and we was milking them. Boy, we was getting anything. We would build everything to the room. Kids, build everything to the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, there it is, Jens, for today. Part two of the Soren Baker, Sir Jenks Chronicles will be coming back. Because we got more to talk about with Coogee Rap. That was, you know, a lot, but we'll get to a lot more. But you know what? One thing, one thing yes. before, you, before we go out and talk about, um, when we started, uh, when we started uh, mixing the record and getting all the songs together, and um, the, the crazy thing is, like, that's when Ice-T did Cop Killer, right? Mm -hmm. That's when Biz Markie got sued, yeah. right? Um, for it was like after she's a friend. It was like another the Gilbert song. O'Sullivan, right? So now Warner Brothers is on complete shakedown on samples. So it took Live and Let Die like man about seven, eight months. They 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 went over the whole record. They was calling me, asking me with samples, not even samples, like. Mm. It would be like a talk and somebody in the background, oh, what was that? Or somebody said that was the OJs, you know. And, <laughs> and then they they took the record back to New York and then they uh, them hotels and all that shit obviously was over with. And uh, and they let somebody else like mix the songs and take mm. the samples out. But I do, you guys, have the original version of the original Cool G Rap Live and Let Die album before they took the samples out and before we had to redo it and do it over. So when we did it over again, we, we had more fun. Like, right. but, but we, I probably, you know, was in New York and he was at, you know, we did the Beverly Glen. I think that's what, mm. uh, 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 man, Warner Brothers, thank you. Thank you, Benny Medina. Because we was, and let me tell you another thing, the funny thing is that G-Rap was the first rapper I ever saw buy a bottle of champagne. Hmm. I thought it was ridiculous. Really? Because, you know, I didn't understand being 20, why would you spend $35 on, a, on anything right. that, that you drink? And G-Rap was the first person that was sitting right and have, you know, a bottle of Moet. And then he was telling me the difference between, like, the white label, the red label, the black label. And I'm like, y'all really give a fuck about that? He was like, yo, man, you know how we do. And then he always have his body. He was the first one. I know Puffy and them had, had it going. But, of course, a lot of people yeah. have st stolen from G-Rap. But G-Rap was the first dude I see come in rocking the bottle. And he'll, he'll come over your house, like. With a bottle? With a bottle of champagne open. Like, usually you like, here, this is for you. G-Rap would be like, nah, this is mine. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> so we had so much fun. But go ahead. You can sign out. You well, can that, edit it different, I guess. Yeah, that's all good, Jinx. <laughs> well, there it is, y'all. Uh, we're going to, you know, come back with Jinx again once we get some more of this stuff because he's got so much more material we haven't even got yes. to yet. I thought we was going to talk about the girls yeah. hanging off the windowsill. We'll, we'll get to that. We're going to talk That's about the windowsill. Oh, you got to hear the windowsill story. We just get down. Yes, Go yes. Ahead. Yeah, great. All right, Jinx. Yeah. Always a pleasure, sir. Always, man. Thanks Cheers, for coming man. through. Sir Jinx, I'm Soren Baker, Unique Access. Hey, well, check it out. Check me out on uh, my Instagram. Come party with your boy. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>